All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight, we are going to look at a new sutta. Uh, we might even be looking at a few different suttas. Um, tonight, we're going to move sections. So we're still going to be in the Samyutta Nikaya. We're still going to be in the Connected Discourses. We had been in the section on the skandhas, <clears throat> on the aggregates. So we had been in, in that section for a while. There's a lot of sutras in that section. And, you know, we didn't cover all of them by any means, but we went through some of the more important ones in that way. And the very last sutta of that section that we talked about last week was <clears throat> the leash. This uh, simile that the Buddha uses that to be attached to the aggregates is like a dog attached to a leash, just running in circles around a pole in that way. And so that sutta introduced us to the idea of samsara. In particular, it talked about the beginninglessness of samsara. So that's how the sutta started, that bhikkhus, this samsara is without discernible beginning. But then that sutta went on to talk about the leash and the five aggregates. So we covered that. But that is our entry point to tonight. So we're going to shift over to... Uh, this is going to be... So <clears throat> you, as you may know... This giant collection of suttas is divided into five major sections, five parts. And we had been in the, the skandha part for a while. Now we're moving back over to the section on the nidana, on causation. And we are in a subsection, a chapter of the part on causation that is... <clears throat> Uh, the connected discourses on without a discoverable beginning. <laughs> so this is a whole little section of suttas. There's 10 suttas here, and they're all about this topic of uh, anamataga. Anamataga, no discernible beginning. So, um, so that's the connection between these different uh, suttas in that way is that they are all dealing with that. So let's, yeah, let's dive into the first of these. Again, I don't know how many we'll cover tonight. They're very little suttas. So the very first one we're going to talk about is called the Tinyakattaha, the Tinyakattaha Sutta, Grass and Wood. So, again, this is going to be the first sutta. Uh, this is uh, technically, this will be Samyutta Nikaya, sutta number 15.1. So, section 15, number one. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Savati in Jetta's Grove, Anatha Pindika's Park. There the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus! Venerable sir, the bhikkhus replied. And the Blessed One said this. Bhikkhus, this samsara is without discoverable beginning. It is anamataga. A first point is not discerned of beings roaming and wandering on hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. Suppose, bhikkhus, someone would cut up whatever grass, sticks, branches, and foliage that there are in this Jambudvipa, in the continent of India, in the continent of Jambudvipa, 
If someone were to cut up all the grass and sticks and branches and foliage in Jambudvipa and collect it all together into a single heap, having done so, they would put them down, saying, for each one, this is my mother. This is my mother's mother. The sequence of that person's mothers and grandmothers would never come to an end. Yet, the grass, the wood, the branches, and foliage in this Jambudvipa continent would be used up and exhausted. For what reason? Because, bhikkhus, this samsara is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not discerned of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. For such a long time, bhikkhus, you have experienced suffering, anguish, and disaster, and have swelled the cemeteries. It's enough to experience revulsion towards all formations. It's enough to become dispassionate towards them. It's enough to be liberated from them. All right. So that's the whole, oh, uh, page 651. <clears throat> Apologies, I wish I would have mentioned that at the beginning. So that's the whole sutta. Let's kind of start to break it down. There's a few different ideas that I want to talk about. So let's begin because I mentioned this when last week. We didn't go into detail about the beginninglessness of samsara. I kind of just skipped over that part because I, I kind of thought that we would revisit it this week. So let's talk about that. <clears throat> so I'm talking uh, about the very first sentence, like the first um, teaching sentence of the sutta. Bhikkhus, this samsara is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not discerned of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. We might be here all night just talking about that. So I did last week, I did introduce the idea of samsara. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about that because really quickly, though, what I would like to have, uh, I would like this to be fresh on our mind. Yes, normally, traditionally, when we're talking about samsara, we are talking about the sort of process of reincarnation, the idea of death, rebirth, life, death, rebirth, and the kind of cycle of that process of what is called in English reincarnation in that sense. But I want to remind you that last week, what we talked about briefly was that the meaning of samsara is the is wandering, roaming. Now they are sort of referring to, or at least originally, they are referring to the Atman or the soul sort of wandering around body after body after body. Like that's sort of seemingly the original meaning of the roaming and the wandering. But as I often like to point out, if you don't believe in reincarnation, you can really think about this, this just in terms of patterns and habits of life, getting stuck into, you know, cycles and rhythms in a way, and sort of the, the grind of life and the re repetition of life in a way. So a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight, even this idea of no discernible beginning. We're, we're going to talk about it in terms of reincarnation, but we can also just think about it simply in terms of our single lifetime. So I want to remind you about that. So I guess, yeah, because I've been wanting to talk about this since last week. So I want to kind of get at what exactly it seems the Buddha's pointing at. And in particular, I want to refer to the analogy of the sticks and grass. So the Buddha is talking about this idea that 
if you went around the entire continent and gathered up all the grass and the sticks and the foliage and everything, and then for like, for every stick, you said, okay, that, excuse me, that stick, that's my mother. And then this blade of grass, that's my mother's mother. And the Buddha is saying that you could go through the entire, every single blade of grass, stick, and everything on the continent. And you would still have not have come to an end of talking about your mother's, 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 mother, and so on. So, although it might not seem like it, I don't know if this jumped out at you when you heard me read the sutta or if you've read the sutta before, but... This is sort of, you know, we are talking about the idea of like, where and when did all of this start? (laughs) When did this suffering start? When did this process begin? Well, the idea of anamataga, the name of this section, is this idea of that you will never discover an initial starting point. That's, again, what anamataga means. And so, yeah, like on the one hand, I think that there's a way to interpret this and understand this, that they are talking about cyclicality. And so in the sense or in the way that a, in the way that a circle doesn't have a starting point, it's, you, you can jump into a circle wherever and you're just going to come right back around to the same spot so a, a circle has no beginning a line a line can have a starting point and an ending point but a circle has no beginning or end so yeah i think you could possibly understand and interpret that idea of no discernible beginning as referencing a kind of cyclicality But that's not the way that I understand it. I kind of have a slightly different understanding of it. So here's one way to think about it. This is going to be a little complicated, but I think you might enjoy it. So we are thinking about, or what we want to be thinking about, for what I'm about to mention, it's about this idea of like, What caused me to be born? Like, what's the cause? And you could sort of look to your mother, like the sutra, as like, oh, well, I came out of, or I came from my mother. So that's sort of an initial starting point or like a cause. That's one way of thinking of it. And then, of course, the question would be, well, where did mother come from? (laughs) So we take a step back to the cause, the cause before that, and we go, ah, grandmother. Uh, But what caused grandmother? (laughs) Great-grandmother. What caused (laughs) great-grandmother? Great-great-grandmother. And so we get this sort of chain of causation. And now if we're thinking about it that way, which is this was caused by this, and this was caused by that, and that was caused by that, it is a very logical question to ask, well, then where did this begin? (laughs) That's what we're talking about, right? Well, I want to share with you and many of my uh, students, I don't think I've talked about this on Dharma doors, but if you've studied with me other places, you've heard this probably from me before. And what it is, is, and by the way, I want to remind you, the sutta that we're reading tonight, or suttas, because we might read more than one, these are part of the section or the major section on causation. And let's remember that in causation, what we are talking about, the entire idea of causation in Buddhism, 
is this idea of dependent origination. And I want to remind you something important about dependent origination. An example or an idea is what causes a car to, to move? And the idea is, is that you might want to say, well, pushing the gas pedal down. You push the gas pedal down, it makes it go forward. Yeah, but only if you have gas. <laughs> so is it the gas that makes the car go forward? Only if you've got spark plugs. <laughs> oh, so it's the spark plugs that make this car go forward? Well, only if you have, and only if you have, and only if you have. And the point is, from a Buddhist understanding of causation, there is not a single cause of what makes the car go forward. It is a confluence of causes and conditions that all the conditions have to be just right, which is that you got wheels and an engine and gas and spark plugs and this and that. So you got all the conditions and then it's a series of causes, the gas pedal, the combustion engine, the pistons firing. It's all a big confluence of causes. To think that there is only one cause, from a Buddhist point of view, that is erroneous. There is not a single cause of anything. But it is a normal kind of default mode way of thinking, which thinks in terms of causation happening one-to-one. -one. That no, 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 this caused this, which caused that, which caused that, which caused that, in a linear one-to-one -one way. That is a normal way of thinking in that sense. <laughs> For example, just one, one more example. Let's say, let's say it's my birthday. It's not, but let's say it is. And let's say that somebody gives me a big birthday cake. And then let's say out of, you know, just extreme excitement, I eat the entire birthday cake. Later on that night, I have an upset stomach, right? It's very normal, it's very logical, it's very rational to say what caused this stomach ache. And it would be very easy to say, oh, all that birthday cake. That's what's making me feel sick. Really? I bet if we investigated that stomach of yours, and really went looking at all of the gastrointestinal chemicals and all of that, I bet it's some other chemical reaction that is causing the nausea. But it's not just that. It's probably a confluence of conditions with a series of causes that are generating a feeling of nausea. But I want you to notice how easy it is to just blame the birthday cake. I feel this way. That's the problem. It was that. And I want you to notice why you would think that. You might think that because you would say, because if I hadn't have eaten the entire cake, I wouldn't be sick. Ergo, it was the birthday cake that caused the illness. But again, we know if we look care more carefully, we know that that's not really true, that that's not actually the, the whole story as it were. So if you're following me on this idea of causation, where there's the Buddhist way of thinking of things, which is it's about causes and conditions, but there is a very stubborn Western philosophical mindset that thinks in terms of this was caused by that, singular. 
And that was caused by that singular. And that way of thinking has consequences. And what I mean by that is this. A long time ago, like actually almost around the same time as the Buddha, <laughs> there was a very famous Greek philosopher, Aristotle, and Aristotle wrote a bunch of uh, books or treatises on philosophical matters, things concerning physics and metaphysics and all kinds of other things. <laughs> and it is in either I think the physics or the metaphysics, I'm not exactly sure, but Aristotle is famous for having come up with this idea. And the idea that Aristotle came up with was the idea of the prime mover. Now, he kind of uses the language of God or a Godhead, but what Aristotle is talking about is if this, boom, was a, a particle that was moved whoop, by this particle, what moved of that particle? Oh, we take a step back and we go, oh, it was that particle that hit that particle that hit that particle. Okay, what hit, that, what caused that particle to move? All right, what caused that particle to move? All right, all right, all right. And this way of thinking, and again, what I mean by that is this, this very one-to-one -one causation way of thinking, Aristotle eventually said, well, there's the original mover, the prime mover. And the prime mover is the original push. And then that pushed the next thing and that pushed the next thing. And it's all been a kind of giant chain reaction since the prime mover. So that's Aristotle. And then based upon kind of Neoplatonic Aristotelian thinking, you get Christian theology. So Christian theology comes right out of kind of the Greco-Roman, Platonic, Neoplatonic tradition. And so the Christian theology adopts the same thinking, the same exact logical thinking as Aristotle, and comes to the conclusion that God made everything. Like God's the original cause and everything else are these kind of ripples after that. Oh, and by the way, you don't get to ask what caused God. You don't get to ask that one. You don't get to ask Aristotle what comes before the prime mover. And you don't get to ask the Christian where God came from or what made God in that way. These are the starting points. Guess what? <laughs> There's another worldview out there that adopts this exact same way of thinking. It's not Aristotelian philosophy. It's not Christian theology. What it is, is it's our basically our modern standard view of the universe, which is the idea that you can trace all of this activity back to what they call the singularity. <laughs> The, sing the, the moment in time when all matter in the universe was a single point in space that then began everything. What I'm getting at, by the way, is I want to show you how if you think a certain way about physics, which is that this caused that, which caused that, which caused that. So if you think one-to-one -one causally, you have to eventually come to the conclusion of the prime mover, God, or the singularity. And there's probably a million other ways to talk about it, but my point is, is that all three of those systems, Aristotelian philosophy, Christian theology, and modern science, they're all based on the same way of thinking. 
And therefore they come to the same conclusions, which is there, oh, there must be an original cause. Not if you are Buddhist <laughs> and you think not in terms of one-to-one -one causation, but you think in terms of causes and conditions. If you think in terms of a confluence of causes and conditions, you will not go searching for the original cause or the original condition. You, would, you wouldn't do that because you are in the understanding that it is a confluence of causes and conditions. So I really want you to like point at the difference in these two ways of thinking. They, they, these two ways of thinking have radical cosmological repercussions. And when I say that, you know, don't take that lightly. This isn't science fiction. This is like what we think is going on here and in that way. Okay, so the question of where samsara started, that's that logical, rational, one-to-one -one causation mind asking, but where did it start? Where did the mother of my mother of my grandmother, where did, you know, where did that come from? And so when the Buddha says, samsara has no discernible beginning, my initial, my personal, my, me, Michael, my initial starting point for understanding that is, oh, don't think in terms of one-to-one -one causation. That's like a, a starting point. So, before I keep going on this, though, questions, comments, answers, ideas about anything related to samsara so far or Aristotelian philosophy, if you like. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, it seems like I'm I'm kind of seeing two pieces to the difference between a this follows this follows this and uh, and the Buddhist. Uh, everything arises from causes and conditions. And, and one is the multiplicity of things that cause things to arise versus one thing that causes it. But the other is sort of a time element. It's like, it's, I don't, I don't think that Buddhism is denying time, but just that um, there's something about uh, things just being, what they are right at this moment, like all the causes and conditions that are there sort of simultaneously, there's kind of a different understanding of time. Is that, is that correct? Or does that vary? Uh, or at least I would say that is correct. And that is exactly sort of what I was going to drive us towards is a kind of that if you think the one-to-one -one causation way, that leads to certain ways of thinking about the flow of time. And as Noam is saying, if you think are thinking about it more in this Buddhist way of causes and conditions, that leads to a different understanding of the flow of time. And we're going to talk about this. So, but so I want to agree with Noam cool. in the sense that there would be a different understanding of the flow of time. And then I just have a, a comment about yeah. this this being relevant to not only heady philosophical things, but to like what is going on in the world right now, where people are trying to like determine the one thing that caused the thing that's happening now. Exactly. What a insanity that is. Exactly. No, this has real world, not just radical cosmological. <laughs> implications but very real world uh ways of yeah ways of solving or thinking we're solving problems by oh let's identify the one cause and just deal with that versus oh no this is a more complex problem than that yeah martin please i'll try to show my face if hello. my bandwidth will allow it hello nice to meet you this is my first time here and i'm this is probably a very simplistic uh, view or question that I'm going to ask, but if there's absolutely no start that we can pinpoint, that means there is no end, if I'm understanding you. So there is no hope for samsara to end. Then why do we do this? That's just my question. 
It's an excellent question. Thought. Totally. <laughs> very good thinking, by the way. Excellent thinking. I believe in a way that the Buddhist tradition would very, it does very much agree with you in the sense that samsara indeed is beginningless and therefore is endless. But I am going to take you up on the idea of the hopelessness and I will give us hope. Um, so actually, yeah, in, in, in order to address Marty's comment slash question, let me jump right to it. I don't want to I don't want to beat around the bush too much because it's already 730. So to put this very like to try to put this as simply clearly as possible, which is asking a lot, but so it's why I, I shouldn't say it's why, because that makes it sound like I had a big plan and I never really have that big of a plan. But I'm glad that we did the Samsara Sutra last week because we there's a very important thing that we talked about in that sutra last week that isn't in tonight's sutta. And what it is, is it's the connection between clinging to the five aggregates, so clinging to the body of form and the sensations and our perception and our habits or our conditioning and our consciousness, that sutta told us that clinging to the aggregates is like a leash that keeps one bound in this endless samsaric process, all right? The thing about it is, is this though. Now I'm gonna try to articulate how I really understand the beginninglessness of samsara. So what we need to keep in mind, and this is so subtle, we need to keep in mind this basic aspect of the Dharma, this very, very basic aspect of the teachings, which is that the self, the idea of the, the our self, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to digress. I'm not going to digress into a teaching about no self, but I always want to remind us that we are talking about that that delusional sense of self that was a child, was an adolescent, you know, that idea of our life, not this here right now, but the idea of me, the big me that goes through time. That's the one that the Buddha is saying just doesn't exist. That self doesn't exist. And my point is, the teaching is that it, it's a effectively a mirage it's an illusion it doesn't actually exist at all that's the problem so the point is there actually isn't anything trapped in samsara so it never started but if you don't know that that's being trapped in samsara it's so subtle I know, and we're we're going to unpack it more and more tonight, but I wanted to try to say it as simply as possible, which is if you understand the actual Dharma about no self, you realize, oh, yeah, there's there isn't anything going through the samsaric process. So how could there be a beginning in that sense? Now what we want to start doing, though, we need to start looking at the mind that is attached to the aggregates. If we look at the mind that is identifying form as self and self as in form, right? Remember the formula, that idea of, oh, I am this body or this body is me or I am these sensations. These sensations are me or I am this perception. This perception is me. So the mind that is clinging to the body of form does identify with the baby that was born of mother. That mind that clings to aggregates that says, this is me born of mother. Mother is that. 
Meaning not only am I identifying myself with the aggregates, I'm going to identify my mother with that body of form. So, so the clinging works kind of two ways. I cling to my body of form and I kind of cling to you as that body of form. So I cling to my mother as that body of form. So then I'm asking the question, well, the, where did my mother come from? But I'm asking the question the wrong way because I'm presuming that she's that body of form. But if I think she is that body of form, then she came from my grandmother. Where did that body of form come from? From great grandmother. But none of those are self. But notice that to not know that is to cling to the aggregates and that's being trapped in samsara. It has no beginning and no end. But Marnie, I hope you heard the hope in that, which is that there is the liberation and release from samsara by not clinging to and identifying with the aggregates in that way. All right, we're going to unpack it more, but I just wanted to try to get that out. <laughs> in that way because i do my personal feeling is is that that's the teaching of the beginninglessness which is that a beginning is predicated on there being something there to start and to end and as soon as you kind of have that realization about anatma or anatta no self it's like oh there just isn't that thing there that is going through samsara but again, notice how subtle the Dharma is in that way of like, but if you don't recognize that, that's being in samsara. <laughs> but wait, you just told me there's no samsara. Mm, not exactly. Mm. I said there's nothing going through samsara. I never said there wasn't samsara. Okay. Everybody doing good okay? Doing good okay with the beginninglessness and, and now endlessness. Again, thank you, Marnie, for that. Everybody doing okay with that? All right. I also didn't get a chance to talk about this last week. And that is, I didn't get a chance to talk about, so now we know why this samsara, or perhaps we know or have an understanding of what it would mean to say that this samsara is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not discerned of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. So I didn't get a chance to really kind of break that down last week. And so let's kind of dive deeper into that because of course it's very helpful if we want to kind of break out of these cycles, it's very helpful to know in a way the problem in that sense. So let's start with hindered by ignorance. Hindered is a word, or I should say that there is a word that is translated as either a hindrance or an obstacle. That's, those are sort of two of the main ones. And the term is nivarana. Uh, N-I-V-A-R-A-N-A, -A -A, Nivarana. The word Nivarana literally means covering. Uh, like a throw, if you were to throw a towel over something and cover it, that's to Nivarana, or that is Nivarana. So in Buddhism, they talk a lot about Nivarana, these coverings. And in particular, what they talk about, or the metaphor, is that these, that Nivarana is anything that covers the mind. There's a wonderful sutra. It's one of my favorite sutras. Oh, what is the title of this favorite sutra of mine? It's called the Sangharava Sutta. It's an old sutta. Sangharava is a Brahmin, not even a Buddhist. He's a Brahmin. And it's a, it's a wonderful sutra that I teach a lot because Sangharava is a Brahmin. And if you don't know a Brahmin priest in traditional Indian society, 
they're um, one of the things that they do is recite from memory uh, the Vedas, these uh, very old ancient Sanskrit poems or hymns. They recite them. But one day, Sangharava can't remember the, the Vedas. He's having trouble concentrating. And so he goes to the Buddha and says, Buddha, I'm having trouble remembering the Vedas. I can't hear them. I can't remember them. And the Buddha says, oh, it's because your mind's covered. And says it's covered by all kinds of things, things like ignorance, greed, you know, sexual desire, different things that the Buddha would say is a problem in the mind in that way. But in that sutta, what the Buddha talks about, he uses a beautiful uh, simile and he says to Sangharava, it's like a bowl of water and you're trying to see the reflection of your own face in the surface of the water. Except, he says, it's like if you're angry, if you're angry, it's like all of these bubbles that bubble up to the surface of the water and they cover the surface of the water. The surface of the bowl of water is nivarana. It is covered with all of this rapid bubbling boiling. So try to see your own face in a pot of boiling water. Uh, good luck, right? You need the water to be, you know, very still to see the reflection of your own face. So that's one analogy. The sutta actually gives five analogies for the bowl of water being covered with different things and therefore not being able to see your own face. So the word nivarana is that image of the, the mind being covered and disturbed in that way, clouded in that way. This sutta talks about the mind being covered by ignorance. And basically everything I just said about self, no self <laughs> is ignorance and awakening or enlightenment. And what I mean is, is that ignorance is thinking there is a self, clinging to the five aggregates as self, and therefore being trapped in samsara. To not be ignorant is to not cling to and identify as the aggregates in that way. So why do why are beings roaming on and wandering endlessly in samsara? Well, one problem is that the mind is covered with ignorance. And so we need the process is to remove the covering of ignorance in that sense. And then the other thing the Buddha says about this is that we are covered by ignorance and we are fettered by tanha. We are fettered by craving. So the other analogy is this idea of, um, well, we did, we've, We've talked about it last week. It's the idea of bandaha, bondage, being like a shackled, being, again, fettered. So we want to notice the difference between the being kind of covered and being shackled. It's kind of two different things. It's like two different feelings. One is almost sort of like, unconscious in a way and the other is kind of rather conscious in that sense so the the craving is this very conscious like wanting all the time whereas the ignorance revol revolving around self it's kind of operating in the background and that's why our minds are kind of covered by it and then we are then shackled or trapped we are in bondage to the craving so, of course, it's no surprise then to then free ourselves from this cycle of samsara is to, again, remove the covering of ignorance and to break the bonds of craving. That's the kind of the, the solution in that sense. All right. Any other questions, comments before we proceed?
Yeah, Noe, please. Uh, the craving, for some reason, the word that the word habit comes to mind. Breaking the habits. That, uh, that yeah. So that's the, 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 the yeah exactly. It's like tethered to these old habits and these old <laughs> reoccurring <laughs> old habits. That's all. I'm I'm so happy you said that, Noe, because what we want to talk about next is so we've already talked about sort of the the main analogy of the grass and wood and the idea of my mother, my mother's mother and so on. But now I wanna talk about the very end. So, <clears throat> and of course, why won't you ever find an end of all the mothers and my mother's mothers and mother's mothers? Well, because samsara is without a discernible beginning. A first point is not discerned of beings roaming and wandering on hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. For such a long time, bhikkhus, <clears throat> you have experienced dukkha. You've experienced suffering, anguish, and disaster, and you have swelled the cemeteries. It's enough to experience revulsion toward all formations. I just want to talk about that. So, Noe mentioned habits and that is exactly what formations are because let's not forget that formations is the you know it's bhikkhu bodhi's way of translating samskara conditioning which is also translated as habits or habit energy so noe you nailed it you nailed it totally perfectly that what we are up against is habit energy but we need to talk about something. And I don't actually get to talk about this as often as I would like. It is, so to escape this, to end this samsaric process, it is enough. All you got to do, <laughs> it is enough to experience revulsion towards all samskara. But what I don't get an, an opportunity to talk enough about is what, what do they mean all formations? All, what do they mean all samskara? Like all my habits? Yes, but it's nice to know or good to know there's three kinds of samskara. We are normally, when we talk about the aggregates, we are sort of normally talking about mental conditioning, mental habits. But it's important to understand that there is kaya samskara, there is bodily habits, there is speech samskara, there is language samskara, and then there's mental conditioning or mental samskara. Bodily samskara are things like breathing that is a habit of the body. And it's a good thing that the body has that habit. <laughs> I often like to bring this up that breathing and blinking and the heart beating, these are all condition, conditioning. This is all what part of samskara. It's the, do, do you think about breathing or does it just happen? Do you think about blinking or does it just happen? Do you think about beating your heart? Are you like, come on, come on, come on, come on. No, it just happens. And that's what habit means. That's what samskara means is it just happens in that way. Vocal or language is about when you were born, you didn't speak any language. You didn't speak English. You didn't speak ASL, American Sign Language. You didn't speak any language. But then you started getting conditioned. People started holding things up to you and saying, this is a cup, cup, cup. And you eventually conditioned the mind or your parents conditioned your mind 
so that you are like, oh, that's a cup. Got it. That's called a cup. And the next time I want one of those, I can say the word cup. I can make that noise cup and I will probably get a cup. It's amazing. But that is conditioning, language conditioning. It takes time to develop that. And then there's the mental conditioning. I like these kinds of cups. I don't like those kinds of cups. And it goes on and on and on. So the reason why I like to mention the bodily samskara, samskara kind of get a bad rap. <laughs> and it's actually better not to vilify samskara, I think. They're not the bad guy. In, 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 again, in many ways, it's keeping you alive in that sense. Like, so it's definitely not the bad guy. But what is the bad guy is clinging and identifying with the formations, with all of the agri or sorry, with all of the conditioning. So in other words, I can notice that breathing is happening and I can be thankful that breathing is happening. Or I could say I'm breathing. Watch. <gasps> See, I did it. I I did it. Did I do it? I think it would have happened whether I decided to or not. And maybe, now if you want to get really deep about samskara, even my decision right then to demonstrate breathing was a conditioning. I was just responding conditionally to the prior thought that happened in my mind. And then that, pro that thought causing all these other thoughts. Now I can claim ownership over all of that thinking and be like, no, 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 I'm thinking, watch. Like right now, I'm going to think of a whatever, right? This is how we think of these things, right? So interestingly, I hadn't really fully planned on this, but I'm really glad that it's come to this. So this idea of I'm breathing, I'm talking, I'm thinking. It seems to me <laughs> that that idea, so by the way, what we are talking about right now is the idea of free will, the idea of agency. We are talking about that right now. And what I kind of want you to notice is that thinking, I breathe, I did the breathing. You know what that is? It's more of that causal thinking that we were talking about. What caused the breathing? I did. End of story. End of the causal chain. I'm the prime mover. I did the breathing. I want you to notice how the very idea of free will is a consequence of thinking a certain way about causation. It's the exact same logic that led to the prime mover, God, and the Big Bang. I want you to notice that the, the way of thinking that leads to thinking in terms of the Big Bang, it also, I'm the little bang meaning I'm the starting point of all my activity and there is no prior starting point. Samskara says otherwise. Samskara says, no, 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 no. There is this endless chain of causation that has led to me breathing right now, <laughs> to me saying these things right now, to me having these thoughts right now. And to actually claim ownership of them, it's delusional. It's not really thinking carefully enough in that way. And for example, I use this, I use this one a lot. I think it's kind of funny. 
and what it is is it's the, my example is of of the illusion of free will it's the idea of what do you want to have for dinner tonight and i think pizza now i like to think that i just had the idea pizza but what we don't think about is that in that moment when i'm having that thought I am not thinking, you know, it would be great if we got some flour. No, no, just hold on. And we ground it up and made like a paste. And that paste, we we laid it out flat in a circle and made like, let's call it bread. And I make a circular bread and I'm thinking, I'm thinking tomato. I'm thinking tomato. I'm th No, we do not think of pizza, like, no, 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 no. We've had it before. <laughs> it's one of the 10 options, right? It's one of our 10 options every evening that we can think of for dinner. And just because I had the idea of like, let's have pizza. It's just a thought that has bubbled up to the surface in that way. But to own it, Again, that's the ignorance that is covering our mind in that sense. And there's a certain degree of craving involved in all of that. That's a fetter. So. Okay. So. The Buddha tells us that it's enough to experience revulsion towards all samskara. It's enough to become dispassionate. It's enough to be liberated from them. Yeah, Noe, question? Oh, you were being liberated from the skandhas. Excellent, excellent. So the being liberated from all formations, being liberated from all samskara, that's what I was talking about in terms of the awakened mind, which isn't clinging or attached to the aggregates in that sense. So that's, of course, what it means to be liberated from formations. And then what the Buddha is dealing with all the time is that rather than being revulsed by samskara, we often are delighted by samskara in a variety of ways. So we are not turned off by them. We are turned on by them in a variety of senses. So, the, of course, if we are being turned on, meaning getting excited or what have you about the formations, well, then it's going to be difficult to abandon and be liberated from them. So the Buddha always, especially, of course, in the Hinayana, in the early Buddhist teachings, it's about developing revulsion towards your body, revulsion towards things of the world, and ultimately developing what they call dispassion. Upeksha, relinquishment. So, you know, I do, and, you know, I'm not going to, I do want to read more suttas tonight. So we're not going to talk too much about all of that. But I do want to emphasize or repeat that, of course, the early Buddhist tradition, which was much more austere, much more celibate, much more monastic, it's it was a little more hardcore in that sense, as far as you know, basically encouraging you to ultimately kind of be put off and repulsed by your own body. As I often mention, the Mahayana Buddhist tradition does not encourage that type of disparagement. Mahayana Buddhism is much more equanimity. <laughs> it, it doesn't want you to be excited or repulsed or, you know, uh, you just put off by these things. The early Buddhist tradition is a little more leaning towards you actually having negative feelings towards the world and the body and all of those things. So let's just keep that in mind that this is coming from the earlier Buddhist tradition. Okay, eight o'clock, please, Noe. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Just real quick. Enough. That, that that word enough, well, where is it? When is it enough? <laughs> Again, getting caught up 
in the habits and the formations and the ideas of, you know, it's like, but then there's that breath. Enough. No more, no less. <clears throat> Yeah, you know, Noe, the way that I read the enough, it is enough to uh, to become dispassionate towards all formations. The way that I read that is, I read that in terms of like the early Buddhist tradition and and like where the Buddha was coming from, meaning what he was coming out of. And so he was coming out of, you know, this forest dwelling, super austere, meditative yoga tradition, you know, and I don't know how much you, you, everybody knows about this, but you know, the, the Buddha during that period was doing all kinds of practices that were very popular at the time. Things like hanging upside down from trees for very long periods of time, like days on end, hanging upside down, things like not sitting down for days on end, not standing up for days on end, all kinds of different austerities. And so there was a whole world of yoga and meditation at the time of the Buddha, of everybody trying to get out of samsara. And it, for most people, it was this real, seemingly this really difficult, arduous process of years and years of these uh, extreme practices and, you know, just utterly beating the body down and beating the body down to submission. And the Buddha coming out of that, I think he's saying, yo, everybody, all you got to do is not be so into it <laughs> like it's enough to just develop dispassion towards these things that's it that's enough and for me that's like uh powerful that idea that that's all it is now it doesn't make it any easier but it's enough in that way so Okay. Yeah, Maria. Something? Yeah. Yeah. Every time we start talking about um, this like deterministic stuff and lack of free will, I always have these questions around like ethical um, culpability and like the moral component of reality. Um, and is it just that? we do sort of in this moment of suchness, there's, you know, past karma, present karma determines future karma. And we have the option to sort of generate karma in, in a certain direction or, I mean, where does the, where's the limit of our ability to sort of push push that karmic stream at least in our general vicinity or I, I don't know how to really talk about it um but it feels like we have um um you know some sense of at least ethical responsibility if nothing else um and it it sounds to me like the teachings are saying that there's there's some agency that we have uh even if it's not you know the self there's something that we're doing we're generating karma um and that can go anyway mm -hmm. um uh, first of all let's think about it as karma is being generated not necessarily i'm generating karma because we want to try to be on careful with that I totally hear you, Maria. This is a huge, huge topic. Like the, the ethical question regarding everything I just said that negates agency and free will and all of that. I totally get it. And I'm going to answer that in a, in a kind of a roundabout way. I want to, the thing to think about is this. So, 
uh, let me, I'm just getting a few thoughts together here, but a, a, a phrase, a common phrase that you hear a lot nowadays, which I think is true, you hear the phrase, hurt people hurt, or hurt people hurt people, right? It's a it's very wise understanding about where kind of violent behavior comes from and things like that. And so the first thing I want to mention, Maria, is that from this point of view that we're talking about, it actually can open us up to a great deal of compassion in terms of blaming people for what they did versus being compassionate towards why they might have done that in the first place. Because if there isn't any free will or agency, then anybody that sort of does anything bad in that way is a victim of that conditioning. And rather than sort of being blamed and punished, they should probably be extended compassion in that way. And I know that that's kind of a tall order a lot of times that um, extending compassion to somebody who's done something wrong. But I want to kind of say something very quickly before this runs away. But just because we do this, just because we have compassion for somebody who commits a, say a, a violent act, we are not saying that the violent act was right. No, the violent act was wrong. Violence is wrong. We can agree on that. But where we are not maybe agreeing is that it's that person's fault. So this is where you get into complicated ideas around kind of truth and reconciliation. And what I mean by that is that forgiveness isn't the same as forgetfulness. If that makes sense to sort of like forgive somebody for a bad behavior doesn't say it was that isn't to say it wasn't bad. So we Buddhism, of course, is an incredibly moral, ethical tradition. It is steeped in nonviolence in that way. It is steeped in truth telling instead of falsehood. It's like so steeped in morality. And I think that uh, these teachings are tricky when it comes to these ideas, but it, hopefully I've kind of shown you where there's not that problem. Maria, with that idea of like, the, I hear you about the moral ethical problem, but it's not a problem. I mean, violence is a problem. People's bad behavior is a problem. But my point is, is that like, just because we're taking away this idea of agency and free will, it doesn't like it changes things, but it doesn't change things. Somebody say something. I need, I need, so yeah, please, Maria, continue. Um, well, so, um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. So, um, oh crap it like totally <laughs> ran away from me um so oh i know what it was so just like their karma brought them to this place of doing violence m my karma has brought me to this place of talking about this, trying to figure out ways to have compassion around that, um, wondering about sentient beings, you know, moral imperatives or whatever that is. It's all very complicated, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And that trying to think of it um, in terms of like a choice point in time is is a lot is a lot like linear cause and effect thinking um mm -hmm. yeah so it's more of like all of this right now is all still codependently arising thinking about all those things um yeah i think it's much more complicated than what's our 
where does the where does the choice point lie? Um, In terms of that, and uh, Lane and Marty, I see you both. I'm coming. I want to say one thing really quickly to try to address the choice point that Maria is mentioning. This might be a good example. It might not be a good example. So bear with me as I as I walk through this because it's sort of it's formulating and I'm I'm looking for problems. There's probably problems, but I think I think of it like this right right now I think of it like this. It's a lot like sort of the internet or YouTube or whatever. And what I mean by that is should I watch that or should I watch that or should I watch that or should I watch that should I watch that show there's so many choices right for what I should watch the idea that there's kind of no free will or agency in that sense is basically saying that ultimately whatever button you put what push whatever you decide to watch there was a whole chain of causation behind you that has led to you choosing that even though you might think that that was the choice point and that you had free will in choosing that one and not that one, if you look backwards, like meaning the the chain of your thoughts, you could probably identify the chain that led to you choosing that one and that it was ultimately a conditioned choice, not free will. And that's going to be true of all those choices and in terms of samskara, by making a choice, I have now conditioned my, and by thinking I freely chose, I am now conditioning myself to feel every time I choose something, it's an act of freedom and ignoring this chain of causation. The real choice point though, Maria, is turning it off. That's actual freedom. That's actual agency. Now, of course, I don't mean turn the computer off. I'm talking, it it was a big metaphor, of course, for the mind. And the idea is, is that any choice you make is going to be conditioned and reinforcing your conditioning. But meditation, stopping, that's the freedom. And that creates, or I should say, it breaks the cycle of conditioning. So that's for me where the meditation comes into this. So, okay, Lane, I think you had your hand up first. Thanks, Maria. A great question, by the way. Lane, uh, you- hey oh, y'all. Yep. Hi. I'm here. Yep. I have my camera off because I'm okay. not feeling great. Um, but we, I wanted to address the accountability idea and and that's been asked of me before and we just had a talk on friday um on being compassion with frank i apologize i don't remember his last name i'm sure no one knows um but one of the ideas is he kept bringing up like the horror of school shootings um and how we definitely need to take action and make that not happen anymore and stuff but also this idea of like people being able to think, you know, of people being able to show compassion even to these school shooters because of exactly what you're saying, because they landed in that position because of all these causes and conditions. So there was this idea like, yes, the police still came and arrested the shooter. Yeah, that happened. Sure. But before that happened, someone held the shooter you know, just embraced that, you know, just, you know, was able to gently disarm and embrace the shooter because they could see, you know, potentially what had led to this action. So it's, it's like a both thing. Like we can have compassion and accountability. That's all I wanted to say. Yep. And we are totally all on the same page. I think on that, on that idea that sort of the wisdom is showing us that it's this chain of causation but there is a very practical reality in that way of accountability that must be upheld. Absolutely. So totally with you, Lane. Marnie. Okay. I'll try to be brief because I know that we're coming to the end here, but 
I'm reading, you know, the, now that we're coming to the end, literally of this, it's, you know, the whole, you know, haven't you had enough of the disillusion, dispassionate, and, you, you know, freed regarding all conditions. When I read that, it's almost like, um, like I gave you all of the answers a long time ago. Why aren't you paying attention? Like, <laughs> there's a way, <laughs> like, to me, it's like, how many times, how many different ways do I have to say it? I, so to me, I, when I kind of read that part, I was like, it's kind of like tongue in cheek almost a little bit. Mm -hmm. it, that's how I'm taking it anyway. So. Yep. Um, by the way, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Marnie, in, in regards to what you just commented on, there is, uh, and we didn't get to the other suttas, we'll get there next week, but it does seem as if this is like information the Buddha has given them before, and he is reminding them of like, well, I've already told you about this. So, yeah. By the way, I would say, so any other questions, comments, answers, ideas? So, yeah, I'm going to, um, yeah, I'll hold off on the next sutta. And yeah, and I'll just make some kind of concluding remarks about this particular sutta. I had one more thing to mention. We got a, or I got um, kind of distracted earlier and it was about Maria. Maria had a few questions related to time. And I had mentioned, yeah, and the way that we think about these things is gonna then affect our perception of the flow of time. So I wanted to just mention that really quickly because I had started by saying, or I had started saying, the what I was calling the one-to-one -one causation, the idea that this was caused by this and that was caused by that and that was caused. I mentioned that that way of thinking, it creates this idea of, of the past kind of bumping the present into existence and now the present is bumping the future into existence so it creates a kind of a linear perception of time which is that well basically that yesterday happened and it is currently today and then it'll be tomorrow you know linear time well there's a different way of thinking about time that is, I wouldn't say it's a necessarily a Buddhist way of thinking about time, but from Buddhist teachings, you can think about time this way. And this is going to tie in to the idea of the anamataga, the, the no discernible beginning. One subtle way to think about samsara as it pertains to the self, as it pertains to time and perceptions of reality, <laughs> a good example, and I'm always using this as an example, a good example is a dream. What's really weird about a dream is that we are sort of just dropped into a present moment, but I don't know about you, the, the, I don't know the degree to which you've explored your dreams in either a lucid state or otherwise, but there's a way in which I'm plopped into a present moment in my dream and not in an exactly in a conscious way, but in a subconscious way, I create the entire backstory for how it is that this situation came to be but I'm creating that at the moment of the dream. In other words, there is no beginning to a dream. It is beginningless. There is no discernible beginning. But when you are in a dream and sort of under the allure of the dream and you don't know it's a dream and you just think it's another day in your life, notice that there's a feeling of embodied experience a feeling of being you, a feeling of it being now, but the now came out of before, but there never was.
cause anything. But the idea in that dream is that what I'm experiencing now came from before and in my dream, it will soon be later. Is there really later in a dream? In other words, time in a dream, it kind of cascades out from the perception of the present moment, which is that I fabricate past and fabricate future, but it's based upon what I think is happening now. Buddhism, at least certain branches of Buddhism, think the same thing is going on here, which is there is this present moment, and you think you got here from somehow, but you're actually making that up right now to justify what you think now is. And that way of thinking is what is causing you to think that tomorrow will be here soon. But what we really need to think about, and this is subtle, by the way, this is like deep philosophy stuff right now, but let's for a moment, let's just for a brief moment, think about yesterday. All right. So just let's for a moment, think about yesterday. I Right now, you take your moment. I'm going to take my moment. I'm thinking about what I did yesterday. So wait, what was yesterday? Saturday? All right. I got it. Did you do it? Did you think about yesterday? But what I want you to think about is what you just thought about. Was that yesterday? Or was that you now thinking about yesterday, which is not yesterday? In other words, quote, yesterday? Whatever happened yesterday is not what just what you just did. In other words, your idea of yesterday, it does come out of today. Because yesterday, it wasn't yesterday. That one was subtle. I'm going to say it again. Yesterday wasn't yesterday. It was today. Remember, yesterday you were saying, you were calling it today. So what I mean is, is that our relationship to the past is based upon the present. <clears throat> so that, that, that last part was subtle. I hope everybody caught that, that what we think of as yesterday is not what happened yesterday, because when that was happening, we thought of it as today. Yesterday's in the past. But when it was happening yesterday, it wasn't in the past. It was in the, quote, present. So I just want you to notice that when we think of yesterday, we're not thinking of yesterday. We're thinking of some other thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good one, Marty. No question about that. You seemed uh, intrigued by that idea. I was intrigued. No, I. it's uh, just reading Marty's comment. Um, it's not a question. It's a it's a comment. I, I heard, uh, I think it was Josh Corda talking about decision making uh, some time ago and he was pointing to some studies that say that it, it was about uh, m making a choice and justifying it and how you think, oh, you know, for example, I I bought that pizza. And the reason I chose pizza is because I like cheese or I haven't had pizza in a while or something. And and it, he was citing some studies. I don't have the, the names of the studies or the details in front of me, but where they we're actually looking at how your brain works and how the brain actually works is the decision just arises. And then some number of nanoseconds later, you decide how to justify it. That yep. you have a sort of a choice in how you justify it, but you don't have a choice in the decision. Yep. That is exactly what we have been talking a lot about tonight, especially this last part. Is that I, I mean, that ties into a lot of things in terms of the free will and agency idea that we were talking about, that we think we have the thoughts when really they just happen. And then as Noam is saying, and I've read similar studies too about that idea that then a few seconds later, we then create the backstory for why that was the choice. The mind, it's amazing. <laughs>
All right, everybody, unless there's any other questions, comments, answers, or ideas, I think that's a good place to, to pause. Yeah, Maria, please. Okay, I think I'm there. Um, oh, I just a quick, quick uh, thank you. I think you may have given me um, an epiphany or it's just a coming together. So when you said the real choice point is to turn it off. So you remember when I said that I was had played all the things and there was a noise and the TV, I think um, now lately I've been leaning more into the stillness and the quiet and practicing turning it off. But I think what I was doing is trying to drown it out instead. <laughs> I think that that was my approach like for so long and now it's almost like taking the training wheels off and now I'm I'm like see it I I don't know if that's a better best the best way to characterize it but now I see it that's the most important thing. Wow. Um so thank you. Thank you. Wow. Amazing. What a great night. Yay. All right, everybody, and that's going to do it for tonight. So we only did one sutta, so we're, we'll keep going with this section. There's, uh, we didn't actually even kind of get to the, the, the real deep part in that way. So stay tuned for next week for that. Thanks again for everybody for being here and new folks. Thank you for being here. So great to see you all. Um, no, any reports? Anything to mention? No, just um. Uh, I, I was, I, I know you talked last week about your meditation classes coming up, but do you want to talk about that or anything else that's coming up for you? Because um, Yeah, well, sure. I will mention that in a week from this Tuesday, so starting November 7th on Tuesday nights from 6 to 7.30 for four Tuesdays in a row, I'm going to be doing a meditation workshop. It's going to be one of my first sort of group meditations that I'll be leading for uh, kind of on my own. Um, and we're going to study the four foundations of mindfulness, a pretty classic Buddhist way to meditate. Uh, but I'm going to put my own kind of twist on it or just present it my own way. So you can go to my website, lotusunderground.com, and you can read more about it or register or what have you.